Hi everyone, this is Pat and today my guest is someone whose work I've admired by far for the past couple of years at least. David Pierce is a pioneer of modern transhumanism, laying the blueprints down as far back as the 90s to how we can engineer a world where supreme happiness in all sentient beings is the norm. David is co-founder, along with Nick Bostrom, of what is now known as Humanity Plus, an association dedicated to research on transhumanism and how modern science can aid life life improvement, life extension, and more generally provide solutions to how we can transcend our perceived human, physical, and intellectual limitations. In 1995, David published his manifesto, The Hedonistic Imperative, considered a highly influential body of work in transhumanist thought and this idea of paradise engineering. In this video, we discuss the long-term goal of abolishing suffering in all sentient beings with the aid of science and technology, and certain challenges to obtaining such an objective, and also some implications for humanity and the world if such a state is achieved. What I most wanted to talk to David about is something I'm personally very interested and invested in, and that is how we might live an examined life, a meaningful, purpose-driven life without any kind of suffering. We also discussed the happiness of genuine psychopaths, something I would call the Ted Bundy happiness paradox, normative ethics, and why all-consuming pleasure or well-being is superior to nothingness. I really enjoyed every minute of this conversation with David. He's a great thinker of our time and an incredibly down-to-earth person to converse with. I'd love to speak to him again in the future, and hopefully that might happen soon. So having said all that, I'm honored to bring you my friend, David Pierce. That's just a brief intro into David and some of his works, but I'll let you talk a little bit about yourself as well. Um, well, back in 1995, I wrote an online manifesto, The Hedonistic Imperative, and in spite of it, debauched title and some kind of nod to Kant. Essentially, it's a plea to use biotechnology to phase out suffering throughout the living world and replace the biology of pain and suffering with life based entirely on gradients of intelligent bliss. And a young postgrad called Nick Bostrom read the manifesto, got in contact and back in 1998, we founded the World Transhumanist Association now rebranded as Humanity Plus. Uh, transhumanism is immensely diverse and broad movement with many different currents. Uh, probably super longevity and super intelligence are the two supers most associated with transhumanism, but it's the third super that has really preoccupied me, super happiness, uh, or to be rather more accurate, I think uh, overriding moral obligation is to minimize suffering um, and the way to do this i believe is through genome reform it's the only long-term way to fix the problem of suffering and create a world based on gradients of intelligent bliss i just say you have a great narration voice i feel like you should be narrating documentaries and things like that this is very mellifluous I think the word is easy to listen to okay yeah so you're a transhumanist it's this idea that we can I guess update our basic condition or state with certain scientific technologies you touched a little bit on that um this idea of using biotechnology to eventually abolish all suffering and sentient life did you just want to expand on like the different branches that could possibly achieve this so there's things like nanotechnology neurosurgery, pharmacology? Very, very crude technologies. One could probably phase out suffering in humans even now under some form of wire-heading direct stimulation of the world reward circuitry. Mm. However, this doesn't seem to be a viable model for civilization as a whole. Wireheads don't want to raise baby wireheads. Most people are, seem to be repelled at the prospect of the exception of severe depressives. So why heading is more of an existence proof that it is possible to live a life without suffering. Um, the two alternatives to why heading are designer drugs and genome reform. Drugs, of course, have all manner of pitfalls, even if we discover a version of Huxley's elusive super soma some form of abuse potential seems to be inevitable. Also, do we really want to drug our offspring from birth? And so I think the only long-term solution to suffering is actually genome reform, which is going to involve upgrading our reward circuitry, giving all prospective parents worldwide 
access to pre-implantation genetic screening, counseling, genome editing. The first designer babies so-called were born in China in unfortunate circumstances a few years ago. Um, yeah, and beyond humans, I think we have an obligation to end the horrors of animal agriculture and also reprogram the biosphere, uh, which will involve technologies such as synthetic gene drives that cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance to cross-species fertility regulation by yeah, uh, immunocontraception, tunable gene drives and so forth. That's probably the last stage of the abolitionist project uh, on Earth. Mm. Yeah. Before we can start systematically helping non-humans, we will need to stop systematically harming them. And the most realistic way we're going to get the death factor is shut and outlawed is cultured meat and animal products. And yeah. yeah, I think really probably what is needed, and I would obviously want to see sort of houses, factory farms shut and outlawed today, but probably the most effective way to actually get rid of them is to lobby for a legislation that kicks in in 10, 15 years or so that closes factory farms and slaughterhouses, which would provide a tremendous commercial incentive to develop, commercialise cultured meat and animal products. And a surprisingly large minority of people do support getting rid of factory farming and slaughterhouses. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm published by the Sentience Institute, I didn't believe it, but it's apparently been replicated, uh, suggesting that 47% yeah. of Americans uh, would actually be sympathetic to the idea of closing slaughterhouses, as though that they're just eating roadkill or the equivalent. So, yeah, I think once fat, once cultured meat actually hits the supermarket shelves and the taste and the texture and the price that is acceptable for consumers, yes, essentially, uh, mm -hmm. the whole animal agriculture will end so yeah stepping back then an overview with humans uh yeah even a handful of genetic tweaks would radically reduce the burden of suffering in the world examples i often give are the scn9a gene the so-called volume knob for pain dozens of variants ranging from nonsense mutations that polish the capacity to experience pain at all to other very nasty mutations that make people extremely susceptible to uh, pain and a whole raft of different alleles uh, in between and if you've ever met the kind of exceptional person who says oh pain it's just a kind of useful signaling mechanism what we want to do is retain the functionality of pain but without the gas mm. skills and one day much more distant future we may be able to get rid of all experience below hedonic zero but until then let's make sure that all our kids in theory it just can be done with existing humans to our gene therapy let's make sure all our kids uh have yeah, extremely benign versions of SCN9A. So pain is essentially trivialized. Um, as well as physical pain, of course, there is psychological pain, that mental pain. And unlike physical pain, there is no single volume knob or master switch of uh, for emotional, mental pain in the brain. But as one sees, someone like uh, Joe Cameron, for example, uh, she was in the news a few years ago, retired vegan Scottish school teacher, very high pain threshold, but also never gets depressed, never, never anxious, just essentially perpetually happy, but in an intelligent, socially responsible way. And it seems she has a nearly unique, I, I only know of one other case, nearly unique dual mutation of the far and the far out genes, which means that she has extremely high levels of anandamide. Anandamide is a cannabis compound from the Sanskrit for bliss, I and mean, it's not literally the bliss molecule that interacts with the opioid system. But yeah, it should be possible, though clinical trials will be wise first, to ensure that all our offspring have benign versions of far and far out. And 
enjoy essentially native levels of bliss not not being blissed out but but blissful um uh yeah so yes it should be possible to uh initially trivialize and then get rid of altogether the the ghastly raw feels of physical and uh, emotional pain risks pitfalls where does one start i mean they, they are enormous <laughs> the, the alternative is sticking with the status quo which is essentially a genetic crapshoot mm -hmm. but a, a genetic crapshoot that involves unimaginable levels of pain and suffering and most people rightly or wrongly think they're entitled to bring new life and hence more involuntary suffering into the world and if one does think one is entitled to do so and for evolutionary reasons most people do seem to have this very strong impulse to reproduce yeah let's give you know give your child the best possible chance in life the best possible opportunities um the e word crops up at this time eugenics but yeah what today counts as it would normally be reckoned enhancement by the standards of posterity is remediation and uh yeah most people seem relatively relaxed not only relaxed about the idea of gene therapy or pre-implantation screening, counselling, CRISPR genome editing to correct acknowledged genetic deficits. They're not comfortable, for the most part anyway, with any form of enhancement. So a lot depends on how we we frame we, we frame this issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem of suffering, I don't want to depress anyone but it is absolutely frightful really you know i think like 800,000 people take their own lives each year uh, hundreds of millions of people clinically or subclinically depressed this immense and often invisible ocean of misery and suffering and for the first time in history the problem of suffering is actually fixable potentially at any rate i mean <laughs> If there were global consensus behind the World Health Organization's definition of health and commitment to good health for all, then it'd be possible to fix the problem of suffering in a century. Recall the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, social and emotional well-being, which is a crazily transhumanist definition of health, because by that Definition, no sentient being in history has ever been healthy. But to get even an approximation <laughs> of health as defined by the World Health Organization, we will need to embrace genome reform. I just wanted to draw on this similarity, I think, between, because I see lab meat or cultured meat has, as you say, a potential big solution to the problem of animal suffering and animal exploitation and also biotechnology has a solution to human suffering and also animal suffering but I think both of them what they have in common is the resistance against those ideas I think both stem from this other fallacy that what is natural is good and if something's unnatural then the solution couldn't possibly be inherently good so that's obviously known as a natural fallacy and do you see that has a major kind of I guess social or ideological impediment to achieving these objectives, which both you and me think is, you know, a good idea. Yes, I suppose a lot of people, for example, would assume that cultured meat is genetically engineered. Now, it most certainly could be genetically engineered with mm -hmm. enhanced flavor, texture, additional nutritional properties. But for the purposes of widespread acceptance, I think it's important to stress that cultured meat is genetically natural. It's, yeah, it's it's genetically the same as meat from uh, lives sort of non-human animals. And I think once any initial novelty has worn off, most people will opt for the cruelty-free option. And critically, once they have done so, probably with a great bit of breast beating and moral indignation, they will insist, rightly so, on outlawing, outlawing factory farms and slaughterhouses and, yeah, essentially harming, gratuitously harming sentient beings, you know, essentially uh, because as sentient as a, as, as a toddler is morally indefensible.
Um, it's I'm, I'm torn because to what extent should one focus on the moral issues? And mm. a lot of vegans and animal activists get quite impatient with talk of culture, uh, culture of meat and animal products, which in some cases is going to be 5, 10, 15 years away. Uh, and to what extent does one aim for, for essentially technical fixes? Um, and sadly, I'm quite pessimistic about, about human nature, that probably humans will do the right thing so long as minimal inconvenience is involved. Um, essentially, yeah, we need a twin track. <laughs> Not okay. a great quality to have in a species. Moral, moral advocacy and development of alternative meat and cultured, cultured meat products. I think the role of, uh, you know, what could one could call it, you know, kind of virtue signaling um, comes mm. into it. Um, but partly too, it, you know, most people find the thought of animal, non human animal suffering distressing uh so yeah it's gonna happen i think it's just a question of time scales so i just wanted to briefly comment what i really like about you and um nick Bostrom working together to found what is now known as humanity plus i think his work a little bit of a generalization but focuses a lot on the risks of things like technology uh the intelligence explosion artificial intelligence whereas your work focuses on the good, what could happen if it all worked out, you know, or what could happen if we implement these ideas responsibly and properly. So it's really great to have two thinkers like yourselves working together and it's a really good balance, I think, or something like transhumanism where um, a lot could go wrong, but a lot, if if we do it right, it could be paradise engineering essentially. So, yeah. Did you want to briefly just talk about what Humanity Plus does in terms of research or funding or anything like that? Because I think most people know what it is, but don't know exactly how it operates. Yeah, I mean, a potted history of the transhumanist movement would take a, a dozen episodes, and I'm ignoring all kinds of, of, of complications. Um, Humanity Plus, the success of the World Transhumanist organization still upholds the principles of the transhumanist declaration this uh or mm. statement of, of of principles but whereas the world transhumanist association during the you know the first decade of this century was the transhumanist organization uh essentially the transhumanist movement has has vulcanized essentially the the influence of transhumanist ideas has grown but one can't seriously claim anymore there is uh there is one single transhumanist organization and yeah. uh although i serve on the board at board of advisors i'm not actively contributing i confess at the moment to uh, yeah uh, humanity essentially i'm i'm a writer uh i feel i can do most good writing and occasionally uh, talking about transhumanism and a particular strand of abolitionist transhumanism i represent building an organization calls for a very different set of skills uh and there is now a trans transhumanist party in the uh, in the united states and a number of other of other countries yeah, yeah very very different set of skills can I just ask how, I'm diverging a little bit from um, the agenda, but how did you originally come to this idea of abolishing suffering? Because I know I read that you originally had a um, scholarship to Oxford to study philosophy, um, and, but then you moved on to other projects. Did it come from like a philosophical kind of, you know, study or wondering, or was it just something that you sort of just yeah, thought, I mean, this I is really shit, like, how do we get rid yes. of this? Well, I say I got the scholarship, so PPE, which is politics, philosophy, and economics. Um, no, really, I would say I used to have the philosophical temperament. I mean, sure, you need to be mm. fairly, fairly bright to be a philosopher, but I wasn't exceptionally intelligent or anything like that. But I used to really brood long and hard about philosophical questions from as as a teenager. Um. Yeah, I was entranced to learn of the work of Olds and Milner on the what were then called the pleasure centres. We don't call them the pleasure centres anymore, but more like the desire centres, the idea that wire heading shows no tolerance. 
Um, unfortunately, none of my friends or acquaintances seem to show the slightest uh, enthusiasm <laughs> for, for wireheading. Now, this is about my teens. And so then I started exploring the idea of designer drugs. But once again, uh, yeah, problems of drug abuse made me skeptical that uh, drugs were the answer. Uh, the human genome needed to say the hand to that when I was at that age being decoded, but this seemed to be the best prospect. And so, yeah, I've got something like the idea of the abolitionist project by my late teens, but these ideas seemed yeah, just so far-fetched and uncovered unpublishable that yeah it's not as though i <laughs> fully worked it worked things out by any means um yeah yeah um philo i wasn't very impressed by oxford philosophy it was the it's kind of the fag end of ordinary language philosophy uh mm -hmm. the analytic philosophy does have vir have virtues not least mm -hmm. clarity you compare a lot of unreadable continental verbiage but I, uh, yes, I was underwhelmed by Oxford. And uh, yeah, I didn't, I couldn't see what I was going to do with my life because this was before the yeah. World Wide Web. And if you did have had extremely, what would generally regard as extremely radical, I'd love to say controversial, but I really ought to say crankish sounding ideas, they would probably yeah. be unpublishable. And sure, we live in a relatively free, country or you can declaim at, at Hyde Park Corner but uh, yeah I, I was I was stymied um, but yeah discovering yeah, the world wide web back in 1995 and realizing that one could upload whatever one wanted for a global audience uh, yeah I mean this was this was a turning point in, in my life yes yeah the internet's really the almost the be all and end all I think of our like media kind of generation because you can do anything you can listen to music you can watch movies and it's this idea that you can choose something when you want it you don't have to wait for something to come on and you don't have to you don't have to plan everything around one specific media it's just all there it's amazing when it first came out that people were skeptical and you know this email thing's never going to take off like <laughs> yeah yes, so it's, now it's kind of sad, I love it you know I sounding quaint but part of me has a so we say yes, uh, more than a little nostalgia for the early days of the World Wide Web. I mean, this was before the the time sink of social media. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I had one of those Windows ninety five computers, like it was big and wide with the mouse. It was so chunky. We had that for a couple of years, and I thought it would always stay that way. And then they got smaller and you know snazzier. But um, yeah, those days where I was just learning to use Google, because uh, I'm thirty three, so it's not like I was born in the 2000s or whatever. I see your ideas has particularly applicable to all species, but particularly this idea of helping wild animal suffering, which is kind of becoming a new frontier, I think, of animal rights. And more and more people are recognizing that suffering is bad, even if it's caused by a natural cause and not just by humans. Because I think previously we were kind of stuck in this natural fo policy driven way of thinking that we should only help animals if they're being harmed by a human-made cause, but more and more people are saying, oh, what's the difference? Consequentially, there is none. Um, so I think I've read quite a bit of work that showing how gene drives and things like that can help wild animals. I mean, we wouldn't even have to start so big if we could just start like vaccinations and basic kind of medicine and like positive intervention, you know? And I just wanted to touch on this, see if you agree with me or not. Like there's this idea that if we intervene, something bad could happen in the wild, but the state of nature is so bad. <laughs> Things are already happening. Why, why don't we intervene with the chance of it being good rather than the certainty of not intervening and it being bad? So it's the principle of indifference over the precautionary principle, which should only really be applied um, if harm is going to happen if you try something rather than not try something. So would you would you say you sort of gel with that kind of thinking? Yes. I mean, if we were, if, if, you know, Mother Nature it was some kind of approximation of the Garden of Eden, then, yeah, <laughs> tampering it should be done with extreme, extreme caution. I still think 
any intervention should be done with extreme caution. But yeah, it's essentially yeah. the lives of the great bulk of sentient beings in nature are nasty, brutish, and short. And there are interventions one can make, such as fertility regulation via for the larger terrestrial vertebrates, something like cross-species immunocontraception, for the the small, fast breeders in inaccessible marine ecosystems in Amazonia, tunable synthetic gene drives and a lot. There are a lot of things one can do. I mean, we mentioned earlier in the chat the SCN9A gene. It'd be possible to spread benign versions of SCN9A across entire species mm. remotely, even, even species, most of whose members, all of whose members live in extremely in inaccessible habitats. Uh, yeah, before doing something like this, one would need to do pilot studies in self-contained artificial biospheres. Um, so, yeah, it's not as though I'm urging delegating stewardship of the global ecosystem to philosophers or something like this. Uh, yeah. yeah, this needs to be done, yeah, extremely responsibly and cautiously. And yet at the same time, recognizing that the level of suffering in nature is utterly appalling so it's it's morally urgent um i've been a little i've been actually quite surprised i never thought that the issue of wild animal suffering was going to be discussed in my lifetime realize <laughs> the reason that it seems to have gained a modest traction is that you're not asking people to make any kind of personal sacrifice when you make the case for mm. Uh, vegetarianism or veganism you're implicitly pointing the finger uh yeah. at at people making them feel uh, feel guilty it involves real inconvenience in some cases um yeah. the case of wild animal suffering something like the issue of predation so, yeah i mean a, a surprising number of people um are at least yeah, partially receptive to the idea. Plenty of people will say it's utterly crazy, of course. I shouldn't yeah. overstate my case. But if you ask, you know, a young, idealistic uh, person, teenager and so on, do you think sentient beings should harm each other if it's going to be possible to phase out predation? A very good member number will say, will say, will say yes. Why not? Yeah. Uh, um, to... When having a debate on wild animal suffering, I think it's probably good to at least give at least some indication, whether it's a brief video or something like that, of just how horrific mm. the problem is. I mean, one doesn't want to over overdo it. Too, too many videos of suffering just tends, tend to overwhelm people, cause emotional numbing, callousness, and so forth. But in the abstract, predation may not sound like a terrible problem, but we're talking about sentient beings being disemboweled, asphyxiated, eaten alive. Now, if it happened to a toddler, it would be front page news, but it's happening right mm. now in the, living, in the living world. And whereas until very recently, the problem of animals, wild animal suffering would sound you know, a bit like changing the second law of thermodynamics or something. It's just the way the world yeah. is. We can now draw up blueprints for a world without wild animal suffering. Um, it's it's clearly it's it's a long term project. This isn't a five year plan. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Yeah, do we want another? I don't know how many hundred million years of pain, misery, and malaise in in, in the rest of the living world. Having said that, before um, seriously tackling wild animal suffering with got to stop animal agriculture we've got to stop the, the the fishing industry there is an air of fantasy about these proposals to tackle wild animal suffering while we're still running yeah. death batteries and though nature can be in some ways unspeakably cruel and in, in the wild non-human animals don't tend to to mutilate themselves and each other in the way that factory farm non-human factory farm non-human animals do unless they're tailed yeah. off, de-beat, de castrated, and so on. I mean, they, these such signs are 
evidence if it were really needed of extreme distress factory farming is inherently abusive uh and yeah of all the sources of severe readily avoidable suffering in the world factory farms and slaughterhouses come first and i i respect vegans animal activists who focus single-mindedly on on getting them shut shut and outlawed rather than go going into these what probably sound like incredibly uh utopian transhumanist ideas of reprogramming the global ecosystem i'm very sympathetic to both so um I, just quickly i like your hobbs reference before i don't know if you intentionally reference him but he says that life in nature is nasty brutish and short i don't know if you were directly qu quoting hobbs but i'm pretty sure that's a direct quote by him Yes, I think he has had humans in mind, but uh, yeah, oh, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah uh, the state of nature or something. It's it's even more true of the lives of most non non human animals. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I feel like what needs to happen with factory farming is people just need to stop doing something. It's quite easy. Becoming vegan was quite easy for me, and maintaining veganism is also quite easy. Um. So we just need to stop mass producing these animals. But with wild animal suffering, the solutions are more involved. I think, what do we get involved? Do we, you know, um, program these different types of scientific technologies and help them? So it just contrasts with the attitudes, though, because people act like being vegan is really, really difficult. But they're more sympathetic towards this idea of helping wild animals. Um, so it's all a bit of a intellectual dumpster fire, I would coin it. <laughs> yes, I mean, if you do put forward a radical proposal, it helps to find some kind of historical precursors or antecedents. I generally cite the Bible, the Book of Isaiah, you know, the Peaceable Kingdom, mm -hmm. the Island Wolf lying yeah. down with the lamb. Um, it's harder with some religious traditions, but let's uh, take Islam. If you do have this notion of an all merciful, all compassionate creator, and we do have the technical means to mitigate and then phase out altogether suffering. What mm. would an all merciful creator wants us to do? Uh, want us to do? Uh, it's not that I want to get embroiled in theological discussion, as you probably gathered. Uh, I'm not uh, a religious believer, but rather than fruitless polemics and metaphysical speculation. Uh, yeah, wherever possible, I think one wants to hammer out political compromises. If we are to mm -hmm. get the problem of suffering fixed, yeah, we're going to need the broadest possible range of support from both secular and religious people. And yeah, wherever possible, I look for what what we have in common with people from different traditions rather than what divides us. Yeah. Can I ask if you're agnostic or more atheist? Or do you believe in some kind of like deity? Uh, I, I could say agnostic, but I'm agnostic in the sense I'm agnostic about the the, the Greek gods or something. It's not really a live <laughs> a live possibility for me. For I I can outline my ideas, possible explanations as for why there is something rather than nothing, but that would take us pretty far afield. Uh, <laughs> it's not a theological explanation. Mm, okay. I just wanted to briefly comment on a tweet I saw by a young philosopher friend of mine. His name is Matthew Adelstein. He goes by Omni sometimes. Um, and he, because you mentioned eugenics before, and I, I'm going to butcher what he said, but it was something along the lines of, we should retire this word because it keeps being used um, against people who simply want to create a better life for others. So if eugenics just means, you know, not harming people who are currently alive, but designing people so that don't suffer and have very high capabilities I'm kind of fine with it you know if that's what eugenics means and maybe we should retire the word because it doesn't really apply anymore in the way that it did when Hitler was doing whatever he was doing I don't know where where you stand on that but this thought I'd like flag it has like an interesting it's difficult I guess the, the Soviet experiment tainted the whole language of social justice <laughs> uh, right. likewise the idea of having good genes, genome reform, ensuring that mm. all beings have a high quality of life. Yeah, this word has been hopelessly apparently polluted. Now one could theory aim for what 
linguists call reappropriation. And there has been a high degree of linguistic reappropriation uh, for derogatory terms used for uh, for gay people, for women, for, for black people. On the other hand, perhaps the word eugenics is beyond is beyond salvation. I mean, I much prefer to use the language of genome reform. I'm a genome reformist. Mm. Of course, critics won't be so prim. They'll ask, "Do you support eugenics?" And, and what does one say? Yeah. I mean, I yeah, I put up, I slapped up a video on the biohappiness revolution on eugenics.org. Mm. Um, uh, but I yeah, wherever possible, I use such to. Terms as, as, as genome reform. Um, yeah, no, I completely understand. I, I'm probably hesitant to use, say I'm pro eugenics or something like that because of the way the word's been used in different contexts. But I also, I don't know if it's possible with the word eugenics, but I also like the idea of taking language back. Like, for example, um, there is a band called New Order, and I think they used to be called Joy Division, and they actually took terms from the Nazi era. Um, but their music is very liberal, very pro justice, whatever it is. So I think they're sort of saying like we don't have to hold these words to meanings that were they're not they don't actually apply anymore as i said i think there's different thresholds and i don't know if it's possible to do that with certain words uh, but i guess that's one example of sort of taking language back and being like we don't have to be out of prison to the, these horrible things that happened ages ago yeah it ought to be trivial but the branding issue isn't trivial at all it's vital to get it mm. right uh and yeah, yeah one needs the right simplistic cartoons, the right the right brands, um, which is yeah, which absolutely, is, yeah. Okay, so I really wanted to talk to you about you sort of touched on it a little bit when you said earlier in the video we want to get rid of the experience of pain but maintain the functionality, and I don't know if that's appropriate in terms of the question I'm about to ask, but what I'm most interested in in life in general, in philosophy, in my studies, whatever it is, is living an examined life or the good life. So that usually involves happiness, but also the sense of purpose, the sense of what I'm doing is important in a moral, social way. There is some concern that, well, there's this idea of, you know, that's been, I guess, popularized by a modern interpretation of something like the Stoics, that some level of suffering, not the horrible suffering that we're talking about, like factory farming, you know, poverty, but some level of like internal struggle or suffering, psychological level and physical, is necessary for meaning. Do you agree with this or do you think, you know, what's your kind of approach to this question? Is the question mishandled from the beginning? <laughs> yeah. And one can tackle this as a philosophical question that is there such thing as transcendent meaning and purpose? Or one can tackle it empirically and if one tackles it empirically, basically the happier you become, the more purposeful and significant life tends to feel. Whereas people who are depressive or become depressed, they tend to find their life draining of meaning and significance. They start feeling empty inside. And this shades in the case of severe depression to nihilistic thoughts, complete mm. absence of meaning. And yeah, essentially no one ever says, I feel blissfully happy, but my life feels empty and meaningless. And that yeah. by upgrading our reward circuitry and ensuring that everyone as a default has an extremely high hedonic tone and enjoys life based on gradients of bliss, simply in virtue of doing this, one will be creating lives that are super meaningful and super significant. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's counterintuitive because often, as you suggest, one does hear meaning and happiness counterposed as though we've got to choose between being happy pigs and serious minded philosophers. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I said, I, I speak of the bio happiness explosion, one could also speak of the bio meaning explosion. Mm. Um, I've, I've noticed yeah, I've got a bit, yeah. Yeah, the idea of, yeah, does life really have some kind of higher significance? But, um, yeah, yeah let's, assume, let's assume it doesn't. Uh, nonetheless, yeah, there's obviously the problem of millions of people who find lives meaningless uh, and that by tackling the biology of low mood, 
one will be creating essentially a world in which everyone finds life meaningful by its very nature. Yeah. So I think, yeah, one of, I was quite persuaded by your thought experiment as well. I think it's in the hedonistic imperative about if you found a civilization of aliens who didn't suffer and they were thriving and flourishing in the state that they were without any suffering, you would never say, no one rational would say, let's inject them with a bit of suffering to give their lives meaning. And that kind of put it into perspective because before I read that thought experiment, I was still struggling a little bit just because I'm so used to this idea. It's in movies, it's in books, films everywhere that suffering gives your life meaning. But when I heard that thought experiment, I thought I would never say, hey, I got the thing for you guys. Like, let me tell you how to live and give you some suffering, you know, make it to just take it up a notch kind of thing. Yes, I mean, one reason for using this kind of thought experiments uh, is that a lot of people are susceptible to status quo bias. And by, yeah. by asking people to imagine an advanced civilization that has abolished suffering and enjoys life based on gradients of bliss, one, yeah, is, is inverting the normal status quo bias. And one is uh, asking what arguments, if any, should we use to persuade them to reintroduce pain, suffering, and the horrors of their ancestral past. Um, and yeah, I suspect, though I don't think we are going to encounter such a civilization, I'm inclined to the rare earth hypothesis, if we were to encounter such a civilization and we were able effectively to communicate, I suspect these alien ecstatics would think of bioconservatives who are pro-suffering in some sense as in the grip of some kind of depressive psychosis. But yeah, it's good that a lot of people to some extent can rationalize the miseries of their lives. But inevitably the rationalization is woefully incomplete. Yeah. So while we're on the topic of kind of uh, thought experiments. Uh, we were going to discuss Robert Nozick's experience machine. Um, I'm sure we're both across that thought experiment, but I'll just explain it quickly um, so the viewers know. Robert Nozick was a philosopher and he, he was a deontologist and he's most well known for his, I think, uh, attempts at refuting hedonic utilitarianism. So one of the thought experiments he puts forward to achieve this is called the experience machine. And essentially he asks the reader, if they had a choice between everyday reality and a simulated reality to be plugged into a machine with infinite bliss, which one would they choose? And I guess if they choose the machine, they're most likely to be a hedonist. But if they choose reality, they have to concede that they are things outside conscious experience that matters. So I was just wondering, first of all, I was wondering if you would choose the machine. Second of all, I see your work has interpreting well-being and happiness and pleasure in a different way than just plugging yourself into a machine and being drugged for your entire life because you're saying happiness can increase happiness and well-being can increase these other areas of your life that you're interested in whether it's work or relationships it's not just about being unintouched with the reality and we step out it's combining happiness and meaning together and actually happiness can increase meaning and purpose in your life so is that kind of so I suspect you wouldn't plug into the machine, but I'm just kind of interested into what you're, you have to say about this whole, you know, conundrum. If I felt that I couldn't anymore do any useful work and I were given the opportunity to plug into an experience machine, I would do so. When VR gets a bit less clunky, I can imagine it is much more appealing than a humdrum reality when you can be uh, emperor or empress of the cosmos and goodness knows <laughs> what else. However, this is not what I advocate. One of the beauties of mm. hedonic recalibration, i.e. raising your hedonic set point and hedonic range so that you enjoy life mm. animated by gradients of bliss, is that hedonic recalibration doesn't involve sacrificing your values and preference architecture and personal mm. relationships on the altar of someone else's vision of paradise. And this is this is really, really important that would you like to wake up tomorrow morning in an exceptionally good mood? Not manic, I think it's an exceptionally good mood, but in the right state of mind to pursue all the things that you care about, your, pro your projects, your relationships. Um, so in one sense, at any rate, the biohappiness revolution can be very conservative. In practice, mm. of course, I 
I think yeah, the the implications are actually unfathomable. But no one should reject the idea of hedonic recalibration because somehow they feel they're they're going to give up what uh, you know the, 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 they really care about and value. I and mean, there are there are there are complications here. But if obviously if someone is opposed in principle to tampering with our genes or reward circuitry, then yes, it does involve giving up your existing values and preferences. But yeah, to use a tri trivial example, after even a massive uh, hedonic upgrade, yeah, people will still support if they football supporters still support the same teams as before. And if your team loses, it will diminish your well-being. But the beauty of recalibration is that yeah, you won't actually <laughs> you won't actually suffer if your team loses. You would uh, uh, experience diminished. Well-being. I mean, that's a trivial example. Something like football, but mm. not trivial to me. Anyway, I'm not a football supporter, but uh, yeah, uh, it's particularly if you've got a very conservative audience. It's worth stressing this this angle that it's not about yeah accepting someone el else's version of utopia or the good life. At the start of the conversation about the experience machine, you said, if I felt like I couldn't contribute any more to this world, my work here was sort of done, I would plug into the machine. So that kind of implies, I think, because sometimes you meet some people and they don't think there is a difference between plugging into the machine or virtual reality because they say that consciousness and your conscious experience is the only thing that matters. So I guess you're, you're slightly diverging from that and kind of saying there is an underlying kind of reality because you know you meet these people sometimes and they say there's no reality and it's all in your head and if I plug into the machine it's no different from this reality where else I think I'm more I don't know what the word is if it's realist or something like that I think there is an underlying kind of yeah like material reality that's important not just like mental state yeah I think each of us runs a phenomenal world sim simulation a skull-bound phenomenal world simulation mm -hmm. but one is entitled mm -hmm make a theoretical inference. Uh, I have the theory that I'm not a brain in a vat or a Boltzmann brain, uh, that I'm yeah. not dreaming or, or taking various intoxicants. Sure, it's only a theory, but there's a critical difference. If I know I'm dreaming and having a lucid dream, I know what I do in one sense, it doesn't matter because I'm only encountering zombies. Whereas in everyday life, <laughs> Even if within my world simulation, technically the avatars of sentient beings may be zombies, I have very good reason to think that these zombies causally co vary with real sentient beings in the external world. I, I now have this theoretical belief that I am speaking to a sentient being, Patricia, uh, uh, thousands of miles away. Uh, I could be wrong, but in anything... To, to do with moral issues, it's best to err on the side of caution and safety. And yeah, it seems, at least strikes me as sadly, all too likely that horrific amounts of suffering exist. And so, yeah, we have a, an obligation to do everything we can to fix it. If we somehow implemented a system of biohappiness of that one day became the status quo. So sufferings in the past now, it's a horrific nightmare of our genetic past or something like that so imagine that's the situation now I was wondering imagine sometimes when these when these things are successfully implemented there can still be like a slight glitch or like a, a setback I think you make the argument that there wouldn't be for reasons I can't remember but you said once this happens it'll only happen once and we don't we don't have to go back but I'm just envisioning a situation where there's some kind of malfunction in someone's brain and what if like a minor headache starts to feel like torture in the middle ages, you know, because they're so not used to that, that threshold of pain at all. Would you have kind of, I guess, and then I thought of solutions, like if we were in that situation, we would have advanced medicine to quickly deal with that kind of situation. But is that something you've ever thought of, or, you know, these kinds of situations where there's like a slight, slight setback in someone and it's a disastrous thing. One wants to have multiple safeguards in place so it's not the case mm. of a single critical point of failure um yeah but 
just like something like smallpox. And now we've you know, we, we decided to get rid of smallpox and now it's gone and it's just it's not going to recur. Uh, and once we have a better understanding of the precise molecular signature of sub-zero experience, unpleasant experience, pain, it's going to be possible to, in a sense, circumscribe this evil zone and create multiple biological genetic safeguards to prevent it ever being penetrated. Um, in the case... I mean, obviously, it is, this is hugely challenging. I mentioned nonsense mm. mutations of the SCN9 aging. People with congenital insensitivity to pain have to lead cotton wool existences because they've lost, to a large degree, the function of nociception. Um, and one, yeah, I, I focused on the genome reform, but it will be possible to have all kinds of neuroprostheses and the like. You know, imagine a sort of implant so that you withdraw your hand from the hot stove with some kind of manual override so you don't feel you've lost control of, of your body. These yeah. possible solutions that, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. Essentially, we need to we need to move to a, a more civilized signaling system. Just as today, there are some people, tragically, who spend almost their entire lives below hedonic zero, essentially... Yeah, their lives are animated by gradients of ill-being. So, some days and some stimuli are worse than others, but they're essentially never happy. There are people at the other end of the scale, and we want to ratchet up everyone's mm. hedonic tone, hedonic range, so that if yeah. this is this is purely schematic, but if today's hedonic mm. range is minus ten to zero to plus ten. Imagine ratcheting things up so it's plus five to plus 15, or ultimately maybe something like plus 90 to plus 100. So long as information sensitivity is retained, then one can yeah. be sensitively, socially responsibly, there can be personal growth, critical insights. Um, there are complications in that if one is temperamentally very happy, one's responses can be biased, but bias can be corrected for. One might imagine that people who are extremely happy and have had extremely high pain thresholds, that they, because they take more risks, one would imagine they would have a much shorter life expectancy than anxious and depressive people. But actually, it seems to be the other way around, that people who really love life are fanatical about preserving it on the whole, whereas depressives, for example, more prone to self-neglect, depression, so depression can take anything from 10, 15, 20 years off people's life expectancy. We want essentially to cre create a world of fanatical life lovers. I speak as a negative mm. area. Yeah. Stemming from that discussion, how do we deal with kind of like psychopaths, like people, because I guess there's this idea that there's a universal definition of happiness. Most neurotypical people, I think, find happiness in similar ways through meaningful relationships or through their work. But you also have people on the outliers like Ted Bundy, for example. And he, from what I've seen in interviews with him, he genuinely found happiness in harming others. And he was kind of, this is just the way I am. Like it was just one of those things. Would Do we have any idea of how these people would be because if we up the happiness in everyone, what if they become more psycho? Yes, I mean, I could. I mean, something like the drug MDMA or ecstasy, which induces both euphoria and a profound sense of love and empathy. One mm. can start talking more specifically about the kind of happiness one wants to engineer. Yeah. But not everyone is comfortable with the idea of turning social life into one big cuddle puddle or something. Um, psychopathy is complicated. It's probably dimensional. Uh, mm. A lot of a lot of males, for example, spend a lot of their time doing crazy so sociopathic things. I mean, I relax playing modern combat, shooting as many uh, enemies as possible. One is yeah. essentially behaving in <laughs> sociopathic ways. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, 
there are also you know, phenomena such as, as sadomasochism, which doesn't refute the primacy of the pleasure pain axis. A masochist, for yeah. example, uh, experiences the release of intensely, intensely rewarding endogenous opioids from activities that neurotypical people would find painful or humiliating. But yeah, there are all kinds of complications like this. Mm. Uh, but like psychopathy is 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 is, is a it's it's a it's a challenging it's a challenging problem. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I mean, just because we, we if the biohappiness revolution took off, it wouldn't mean that jails would suddenly be obliterated. There will still be jails for people like this. I guess I'd just be, you know, they'd probably it'd probably be better for prisoners as well because they wouldn't be so upset about their situation. <laughs> Yeah, in some ways, it's like it really needs genome possible. reform. One needs educational uh, reform, um, but yeah, uh, in, uh, I suppose I, I, one has to resist the temptation to sort out all the all the problems that the, 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 the problems in the world. And yeah, I mean Ted Bundy's are. Uh, <laughs> Do, do do pose a challenge, but yeah, most yeah. people they may be they may be callous, but most people on the whole aren't malicious. Uh, and mm. sure, if someone okay. wrongs you, you may behave in vengeful ways or something like that. But most people don't go yeah. around just enjoying causing uh, causing suffering. Um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely like a case of exception. How to deal with these kind of individuals in a biohappiness country or state or world. And I, yeah, there's a variety of solutions that we just discussed. Because I yeah. think you could probably design people so they make better choices, mm-hmm. like in terms of implementing more compassion or empathy, so they're recognised. Because I'm sure there's lots of psychopaths that want to be violent but just don't for social kind of reasons, you know. So there's I probably a way to like... engineer a, a, a psychopath, for example, to exhibit... Uh... Uh, mirror touch synesthesia if someone with mirror touch synesthesia if you stub your toe will experience uh, a comparable level of distress um yeah. yeah if we were all mirror touch synesthetes there wouldn't be any psychopaths um, um but of course <laughs> most of us aren't mirror touch synesthetes and levels of empathy and compassion for all on the scale it's not simply a matter of wanting everyone to be more compassionate it's just as important mm. that people learn how to systematize indeed hyper systematize I and mean, this can be a real mm. problem when it comes to urging global solutions to the problem of suffering reprogramming the global ecosystem a lot of radical vegans for example are not comfortable with the idea of phasing out predation and the kind of interventions needed for compassionate stewardship so it's yeah it's getting the right balance between uh the compassionate yeah. impulse and the systematizing impulse i think it was on one of sam harris's podcasts who i listen to quite regularly and it was part of a broader philosophical discussion but it came to a hypothetical about whether if a pill was available that you could take to eradicate grief when a family member dies or someone very close to you dies there's kind of this question of is it immoral to take that pill and how it relates to this is I'm just trying to imagine how people would deal with and with an emotion like grief which it always involves suffering I can't imagine grief not involving suffering unless there is a way to imagine it which I'd be interested in hearing and that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if people couldn't feel sad when others passed away or were in pain or something like that but it does kind of raise an interesting like kind of of human behavioral moral question of how we should be in terms of mannerisms and what we should feel when someone else might be you know about to but then there's also this question of if we're at this state where it's the biohappiness revolution, there's probably things, because I know there's a lot of different groups working on transcending death as well. So that might not even be, you know, people might be living longer and longer and longer at that stage where it's not that relevant. And the long-term solution, yes, as you're alluding to, is going to be to defeat aging and death. But that's very much a long-term solution that barring very, very radical medical developments, there is going to be grief in the world for foreseeable, foreseeable future, or rather, I think bereavement and mm. 
I normally respond if someone asks this question, which yeah, it, it's it is is troubling. If 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 a good friend, loved one, family member dies, well, I wouldn't want to keep on partying. Is that <laughs> I would want my death or misfortune to diminish the well-being of friends and loved ones, but I wouldn't want them to mm. suffer on my account. Yeah. And if if you want anyone to suffer on your account, in what sense is it really love or friendship and to what extent yeah. is is it is it sheer egotism and yeah as i said selfishly yeah. perhaps i would want if something bad happened to me it should be diminish people's well-being but i wouldn't want them to slip below hedonic zero and yeah i yeah i so long as we retain the signaling function for good and bad stimuli then yeah when bad things happen to friends and family, it will and it possibly should diminish well-being. But I don't think mm. we've been conserving experience below hedonic zero. But I mean, a lot of this is yeah. details that in the long run, just yeah. as silicon robots can be upgraded and repaired indefinitely, the same is true of organic robots. And it should be possible to phase out bereavement. Um, but yeah, that's very yeah, uh, very long term. In, in the meantime, the biology of reward, emotion, pleasure and pain has been probably much simpler, still very complex and easier to fix than the biology of aging. Um, mm. I think it's possible to, to lay out fairly detailed blueprints for how we can technically at any rate get rid of suffering, socio-political yeah. friends are another matter. But in the case of aging, transhumanists still offer a lot of promissory notes. The maximum human lifespan appears to have plateaued below 120 years. Uh, yeah, uh, although I'm interested in radical life extension, I think older people at least should consider if they're life lovers signing up for cryonics. <laughs> I also question, I don't know if this is going to sound cold or whatever, but I kind of question this idea of why sadness is required as a sign of respect. Like I just, you know, if somebody passes away, like I understand because I'm a part of this world and that's what happens, but in a philosophical way, I don't really get why sadness is a sign of, you know, because in, so for example, it's something like Chinese culture, funeral, in certain parts of Chinese culture, funerals are often celebrated as a, it's kind of more, the emphasis is more on the celebration of someone's life rather than, grieving their death so I think there's different ways to show uh your affection or like tribute to someone after they pass away so that's one way of showing how I why I think it's a little bit weird sometimes and there's also this part I know there are two different examples but in the novel Watership Down by Richard Adams which is about rabbits they were talking about the behavior of the rabbits that when someone one of the rabbit companions dies uh they move on nearly straight away and it's not a sign of disrespect or that they didn't like that that rabbit it's just rabbits are programmed psychologically to just live in the here and now and it doesn't mean that their love or their caring was any less for the being that was alive so I just think there's different ways to looking at grief and I think it is important to question to an extent why these negative feelings are necessary you know we've made them culturally necessary but you know intellectually or scientifically maybe they aren't so much yes I'm, I'm more comfortable with the idea of hedonic gradients than that I am with the idea of being happy, still very happy <laughs> after someone's passing. And yet, yeah. I would normally draw on a, a silly YouTube video, but I recall someone's, they were showing someone's funeral, the, the mourners, everyone looking very sad. And then there was from inside the coffin, a knock, knock sound, let me out. The uh, the person, <laughs> the the the, the, the uh, yeah, the, the, the late victim had decided he didn't want people being all sad at his funeral. He wanted to make people laugh. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, it's, yeah. It's that it's that kind of sentiment I was kind of channeling into. I mean, I normally say if someone trying to comfort someone who is bereaved that yeah, essentially no one ever gets deleted from space time for better or worse. And but yeah, yeah. each of us tensely occupies the coordinates we do. This isn't going to change, just on those spatial boundaries, one has temporal boundaries. Um, yeah, in some ways I find this quite disturbing because of all the bad stuff, 
but yeah, the good stuff is still timelessly there too. So okay, so I did want to ask you a bit more in depth about normative ethics and your normative ethical stance on certain, I guess, important philosophical quite kind of question so you're a negative utilitarian I understand well that's according to wikipedia that's what you were so making sure you're still that yeah yes I yeah. Just, one okay. of the most unsexy unappealing brands in all the world <laughs> it sounds much more appealing if one says one is a, a neo-buddhist or something like that but yeah mm. I would yeah. think our overriding obligation is to minimize suffering <laughs> I would walk away yeah. from Omelas if you recall that as well Novel from Ursula Le Guin. The ones who wait, walk away from Omelas, the city of fabulous delights, the city of Omelas. Everyone has an absolutely fantastic, wonderful time. And yet for unexplained reasons, this city depends on the existence of a tormented child in the basement. And the citizens of Omelas, mm -hmm. good classical utilitarians, one assumes, uh, yeah, I think this is a price worth paying for this this little horror, because after all, compared to the fabulous abundance of delights in the city, yeah, it's a mere pinprick by comparison, this tormented child. But yeah. the minority of people who would walk away from Omelas, who walk away from Omelas, and yeah, I'm a negative utilitarian. I would yeah. walk away from Omelas rather than create a new Omelas. Uh, of course, real yeah. life, it's nothing like Omelas. It's, it's not, our world is not a place of fabulous delights but pain misery and suffering at least a lot a, a lot of the time but yeah that, that that particular little short story highlights the underlying <clears throat> motivation behind negative utility yeah yeah well i'm a moderate deontologist so i would walk away from that situation as well because of the violations of the rights of the child but as a moderate or threshold deontologist, I'll permit certain rights violations, but the consequences have to be like supremely good. It's not enough that entire city is happy because this child's tormented. That would be the threshold. It wouldn't be, it would be below the threshold. If it was reducing many other suffering and it produced a happy city, maybe, you know, because you're saving all these other kids from suffering. But if it was just about maximizing happiness of a city for torturing a child, that doesn't really make any sense to me. But yeah, that would be my main objection to classical utilitarianism is that it permits too many rights violations in situations where it probably shouldn't, but negative utilitarianism wouldn't because of the emphasis on suffering. So I think it's more aligned with deontology that way. But what I really wanted to ask you about was I've had several debates about antinatalism. A couple of them are on the channel. And I think it's this topic that people get really passionate over um, because it addresses quest like very deep questions about whether we should be living, what, what is sentience, what does it mean to... Uh, why is it better to live than to not live? So obviously a lot of your life work is dedicated towards engineering a kind of paradise on earth. So my interpretation of that was that you would probably not be an anti-natalist, which assigns a negative value to birth. So you're not really meant to create any sentient life. But then the counter arguments to that is, there were, well, there's several, but one of them is wild animal suffering. So the more humans die out, the more wild animal suffering comes back and you're just creating more and more suffering, at least with humans on the planet. The good ones, there's a chance that you would improve. But what I, I wanted to ask you a bit even more basic than that is, it's this philosophy closely associated with antinatalism. It's called alphism. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that the supreme state is actually not um, happiness as we discuss it. It's not flourishing, but it's nothing. So they think, alphas, alphas think that nothing is superior to a very good world or a moderate world with a little bit of suffering. And I don't think this is so. Like, I don't think you can compare absolute nothingness to the most pleasurable world imaginable. It's very obvious to me, a very perfect world. A perfect world is better than nothing. Yeah, I mean, the, the big appeal of classical utilitarianism is that one of its bigger fails anyway, is that it's the most mm -hmm. credible option for naturalizing value and disvalue. That if the mm -hmm. badness of pain and suffering is self-intimating, and I think it is, that agony by its very nature is ghastly and disvaluable. It's not an open, open question. Yeah. By parity of reasoning, extreme pleasure uh, is valuable. Um, and that's seemingly a strong argument against suffering focused ethics negative utilitarianism anti-natalism this 
with the, the, this kind of option. However, I think if you think about it, uh, classical utilitarianism is an a absolutely frightful ethical doctrine, and I choose my words carefully. Uh, thought experiments can be very instructive in philosophy. Most of the time when it comes to utilitarians, mm. philosophers tend to be focused on things like the trolley problem. But yeah. there is one disturbing thought experiment I came up with. Imagine a genie offers me the option of super exponential growth in my happiness at the expense of exponential growth in your suffering. And obviously, mm. that's unimaginable, frightful torments for you. But this is this is the genie's offer. If I am a classical utilitarian, I'm obliged to accept the genie's offer because and I will be feeling absolutely, sublimely, unimaginably more wonderful each, 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 each day. Um, anyhow, getting back to what we, were, what we were saying, fortunately, the abolitionist project doesn't depend on having a particular stance like this. Classical utilitarians, mm -hmm. negative utilitarians, secular, religious people can... I would say, yeah, except that we should aim to phase out the biology of suffering. In the case of antinatalism, I describe myself as a, a soft antinatalist. I don't personally think one is morally entitled to bring new involuntary suffering into the world. In the course of a lifetime, even the happiest people today experience bouts of intense suffering, just unhappy love affair or something, something like that. Mm. But the future belongs to life lovers, that by choosing not to have children and adopting, one is simply intensifying selection pressure against any predisposition to antinatalism. And yeah, not having children is not going to fix the problem of suffering, whereas genome reform of both humans mm. and humans can fix the problem of suffering forever. Now, yeah. I can understand the frustration of some strong antinatalists effortless, uh, at this response because intuitively it is much, much simpler just simply not to breathe than it is to embark on some fantastical global scheme to reprogram the living. I mean, it's, though I've set out blueprints and so on, yeah, it is, it, it is daunting. But yeah, it's this argument from selection pressure that unfortunately mm. people like David Benatar simply don't address that there is always going to be intense selection pressure against any predisposition uh, not to have kids that as well as the horrors and the mundane nastiness of suffering and malaise nature yeah has, mm. has provided us with this capacity for yeah, uh, yeah. To, 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 in, to enjoy life, to get highs, it gets us hooked on this supply of opioids. We're all opioid addicts, whether we realize it, realize it uh, or not. And yes, for evolutionary reasons, most people do have this urge, quite often a desperate urge in the case of victims of involuntary childlessness, uh, to have kids. And sadly, we need to work with the grain of human nature. Is your soft antinatalism sort of contingent on the fact that the world we currently live in is so suffering is just rampant? Would you still be soft antinatalist if we achieved, you know, a world that was actually as you envisioned it by happiness revolution? Then I don't see any issue with sort oh, of oh no, I mean it's it it how many babies you want. You phased out yeah. experience below hedonic zero I and mean, the hedonistic imperative. I suggested this would be. A few centuries from now, the world's last experience below hedonic zero and some obscure marine invertebrate. Um, once life, sentient life by its very nature, is rewarding, enjoyable, then yes, I mm. can't see any need to be an antinatalist. Indeed, I suspect even things like negative utilitarianism, suffering focused ethics, will seem like this kind of psych depressive psychosis from a bygone era. But for now, at yeah. any rate, of course, this is this is fantasy. And yeah, though, if someone presents me with their newborn babe or something, I do and say how beautiful the kid is. <laughs> Privately, I'm thinking, God, this is sentient <laughs> malware. Who knows what horrors the poor kid is going to experience in the course of a lifetime? 
Um, but, but on the flip side, they could experience a lot of bliss and happiness as well. So let's not forget. Yeah, yes. I, yeah. Possibly because the uh, yes, happiness has not loomed especially large in my life. I'm more prone to uh, yeah, brood on the darker side. But of course, yes, most people in the course of a lifetime do experience sometimes very beautiful moments. And yeah, my tentative prediction for the future of life on Earth is yeah, life based on superhuman bliss that is just physiologically unimaginable today. Yeah. Yeah. So, give, so given the choice, I, the supreme condition for me would be the world as you envision it by happiness, and that would be the norm. And then anything above that would just be like super happiness, extreme happiness. Um, that to me is what we should be aimed for. But there are certain alphas and people in that demographic that say the word like nothing at all non-existence is the actual goal so how do you do you compare the two do you see the happy world better than non-existence or do you think they're just inherently not comparable with each other because there's people that would rather um, nothingness than a world with a lot of pleasure and they're just being poked by a pencil once a month like I've spoken to people like this you know because any kind of discomfort is not tolerated that would just prefer the world not exist in this come on yeah I mean this is I mean just as earlier I presented what I consider a reductio of classical utilitarianism the most yeah obvious reductio of of negative utilitarianism is some version of the pinprick argument uh yeah it's I mean though I mean, the term negative utilitarianism was was coined by uh, uh, Popper and J and uh, Nimian Smart's response to Popper. Popper mm. was that well, uh, negative utilitarianism would mandate somehow painlessly destroying the world, but with um, but I would have no personal no hesitation about pressing your button to get rid of the, the frightful horrors of today's world, but. Yeah. Would I, if we lived in a blissful society in which everyone was having a fabulously rich, rewarding life, a entire blissful civilization, would one press a button to avoid a mere pinprick? And this seems absurd. And yeah. as <laughs> one allows this, well, what about two pinpricks or or something yeah. a little bit worse than a pinprick, but not severe pain? Um, and it's a, a difficult problem for negative utilitarianism. Mm. I mean, given that the idea that life might come uh, life might come to an end is extremely upsetting for a lot of people who enjoy life, I think one wants to prevent if one is a negative utilitarian, one wants to prevent the slightest element of anxiety or disappointment. So one enshrines in law the sanctity of life. So one isn't going to allow. Uh, yes, people to be uh, well, the world to be uh, eradicated with the press of a button or anything like that. But yeah, although yeah. these these thought experiments can sound fantastical, I think they're useful because yeah, it's the best way to test an ethical theory. Uh, some philosophers would want any ethical theory to be plausible, but should ones should the correct theory of ethics? If one exists, be intuitively plausible any more than physics should be plausible. This this isn't clear. Mm. David, it's been really fantastic talking to you. I think we covered a lot today. It's been an absolute honor. I've been I don't know when I started reading your work. It must have been three or four years ago. Um, I discovered the hedonistic imperative. You've been doing, you know, all this important work since the nineties, and I just there are people out there who just really appreciate you, and I'm definitely one of them. Patricia, it's been wonderful chatting to you. If you're ever in this neck of the woods, do pop in and uh, we must have afternoon tea and a chat. But until then, thank you and thank you for your listeners too. And if you've got any follow-ups, just drop me a line. <laughs> I would love that. Thanks, David.